Hello there YouTube, this is Sibbles and Bits back at it again. Here we're going over the August patch notes. Today, August 30th, we've uh, gotten the DLC 2 for Back for Blood, Children of the Worm. And it's very exciting because again, like I said in previous uh, previous video, not only are we getting new maps with the uh, with the new DLC, uh, six new maps, pretty much the same that we got with Tunnels of Terror. Tunnels of Terror had great maps, so I'm looking forward to the new geometry and all of that. And uh, this expansion, however, I'm more excited about uh, the new tech that's going to be put in here because there's going to be a lot of new mechanics. Uh, generally speaking, with these DLCs, this is where they start pushing the mechanical boundaries of the game. Uh, could even see that in the new maps, but uh, that'll have to remain to be seen. Could be seen in the new enemies, even. I know that uh, from the dev stream, one of the new enemies has permanent armor on them, which is interesting. But um, as far as cards are concerned, we've got stuff like uh, the ability to spend ammo to activate what are called gadgets, which is an ability that goes over your offensive uh, medical or quick slots. And it gives you something that's theoretically only you can do in the squad because and we'll get to there when i uh if it comes up but you don't want to disable multiple of the same slot in a squad because you need that flexibility but it's uh it's quite interesting because it looks like a way for you to like build a team around a concept without like having to introduce like 16 different cards in order to facilitate a new game or game type or a build type we'll have to see how they work out anyways we're going to go over the patch notes today uh gonna try and do this in under an hour because it takes me more than an, <laughs> like double the time in order to edit the video and i'd like to get this out to you guys at a reasonable time of course most of you guys are probably playing right now i am not really able to play until the weekend and on that note I will be streaming on Twitch Friday, Saturday, and possibly even Sunday, starting at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And I hope to see you guys there. It'll be uh, twitch.tv Sibbles and Bits, exactly the same as uh, the YouTube uh, handle. And it'll be my first stream, so I'm sure there's going to be tons of bugs. I'm probably going to be most of the bugs because I'm going to have to figure out how to like navigate all that. But will be labbing live so in other words not necessarily like playing to play the game which most people would probably be looking for what we're instead going to be doing is going through the thought process of what i do every patch which is figure out all the mechanics try and find some bugs um start analyzing like uh okay is this card buff enough where would we use this how can we make this, you know, like feel a little bit good? Um, taking a look at the new cleaner Dan, taking a look at uh, the new weapons, accessories, just trying to figure out as much information about the patch as we can within um, three days of, you know, moderate amount of time and just seeing what we can come up with. If you're willing to drop by and hang out, you can feel free to ask questions as well. I'll be willing to uh, chat, chill. No matter what you want to call it. Otherwise, if you can't make it or you'd prefer not to watch a Twitch stream, that's perfectly fine. If you do have questions you'd like me to answer, go ahead and leave them down in the comments below, and I'll add that to the list of things to check out. Otherwise, I'm in order to give the most authentic experience of going in fresh as I possibly can, I am pretty much like <laughs> I don't want to say leaving. I'm going on vacation from the Discord, the Back for Stats Discord. So they're going to do everything that they do, right? They're all perfectly talented and capable. So if you don't want to wait till Saturday to figure out burning questions, you can go ahead head over there. You can search uh, Discord for Back for Stats, all one word, letter, or sorry, number four and head over there and uh, ask 
everybody should be more than willing to help you out. It's just a question of, you know, if it's a difficult test that you're asking for, it might take a while for them to get to that. Anyways, with all that aside, we are going to start going through these. So looking through all this, this is pretty much just um, talking about, you know, Act 5. The one thing to note is that I believe Burnt Toast on Reddit clarified that you cannot matchmake into Act 5 like you can matchmake into, like, tunnels and just, like, happen to end up in a area where uh, the DLC is active because you joined somebody else's game and they had it active. You have to have Act 5 in order to quick match into Act 5. Otherwise, if you and I are partied and I have Act 5, everything's perfectly fine. The one thing that we're going to have to distinguish, which I believe we know, but how exactly do enemies and stuff like that work? Because we've got new accessories, which may be base game, may require Act 5. We've got new enemies and new weapons. Those two, I believe, would require Act 5, but maybe not. If Act 5 and um, the pre-apocalypse skins were the only things that were technically in the the DLC. I wouldn't say that it'd be weird, but due to the fact that people can't readily access those things, I don't know. Oh, and Dan. Um, Dan for campaign would be locked behind there as well. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that's split. Probably not going to talk about that much more going forward unless it becomes relevant. Okay, so Act 5, six new maps. Already pretty much talked about that. Actually, hold up. I was under the assumption that these duffel bags would not be in Act 5, but it's under this bullet here. And what it basically seems to be is it's... Pick up and carry to the end of the mission for a reward. So I'm guessing that this is kind of like a propane tank. You know, a heavy item that you pick up, slows down your sprint, and you've got to cash it in at the end for um, something. Uh, they say a reward. Uh, on Twitter, Burnt Toast said that, and I've actually had it confirmed, uh, somebody told me, that uh, the new cards are not available in either the supply points or uh, the skull totems. So likely, this is how you're going to unlock those new cards. Which makes it weird that they would stuff them in Act 5, because then you would need the DLC or somebody with the DLC in order to access it, whereas you can, like, again, randomly matchmake into Tunnels of Terror and get Skull Totems without having to do that. So that might be a bit yikes, but we'll see about that. Um, new Cleaner, Prophet Dan. So... Prophet Dan is a new character that is pretty much entirely revolved around people getting incapped. So he's been sort of a hot topic in the community. Lots of people say that he's absolute shit because of the fact that, you know, people have to get incapped. And the only time you get incapped is when you're uh, doing it entirely on accident, right? Or like you're fucking up, stuff like that. It's, re air quotes, rewarding bad play. But, I mean... Again, not to, uh, like, toot my own horn. Pretty much, like, day three of the game's life cycle came up with the idea of the Necromancer, which was utilizing these in-cap cards in order to provide, like, massive damage and burst heals to the team. You can still utilize a character like this aggressively. It's just, you pretty much need to... <laughs> Your team needs to be on board, right? Because otherwise, if, especially now that Friendly Fire has been released, if uh, you, like, gun somebody down to give everybody damage and healing and one person doesn't like it, they just got to vote you out and then you get kicked. So it's very weird that they would put that in here and then release Prophet Dan. Maybe they weren't considering that that's, like, a very good way of utilizing this. Because you can incap somebody... Uh, use Avenge the Fallen, and 
if you have three copies, that's pretty much double damage because uh, that bin is multiplicative with everything else. And when you deal double damage, um, you can pretty much obliterate bosses. <laughs> so you can take less damage on the team because you don't have to worry about the bosses. Purposefully incap somebody. Everybody gets healed. Um, you can convert uh, Inspiring Sacrifice into THP with Overheal if you want to. Mom will also like give everybody a ton of THP. Good buffer. Uh, pretty much is a good circuit breaker in case something actually does go wrong. And then everybody just gets double damage and just absolutely massacres everything. Anyways, um, his talent technically is a team effect because it says here reviving teammates provides a random effect. But during the dev stream, we saw that technically anybody can revive people and get these random effects. And of the random effects, there is uh, what I call the grenade surprises which is just random grenades flying everywhere. They can be flashbangs, the new smoke bomb accessory, or frag grenades. It can be a 5% damage boost. It can be a 5% damage resistance boost. The dev said that those didn't stack. If that's the case, that seems pretty shit. So that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at when I first start labbing the game. Because if it's 5% in its own bin, and it can stack up multiple times, that's actually quite significant if you get only even two of those. Like, that's a free card on the whole team. On top of the fact that you might also get damage resistance a number of times, and you're able to turn lives and money into stats for difficult maps. One of them is a full team heal. It seems like it's recover. I don't think we've seen any overheal because of it. So it just like puts you up to your current trauma cap and white health. It can be uh, plus one team life, which is extraordinary. And it can be copper. Now, I broke down the dev stream in a couple of areas. And it looks like the copper piles that you drop, you drop around for some i may have missed some piles on some in caps where this happened but you're getting four piles around 100 copper but generally less so like somewhere between 300 to 400 and it does not share through the team a little weird it's most of a card at least if for whatever reason you're having difficulties getting that it's access to an fac for the most part I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not, it also doesn't seem to happen enough for you to be like, okay, we're going to turn lives into money. It's, it's not going to be reliable for that. And if you're ever like playing Dan, expecting to get a specific effect, you're going to get burned. So you can't really, like it, <laughs> it's literally gambling. Um, in his team effect is to increase damage resistance and knock back immunity. It's weird that even in the patch notes they don't specify this. This is only while reviving somebody. Yeah, this is only while reviving somebody, I believe they said. So, knock back immunity while you're being revived doesn't seem that that good in campaign. I know that Keithustis over in the Swarm community is freaking out about knockback immunity. Probably rightfully so. Like, uh, that game's around getting people incapped and then preventing them from being incapped. So, keeping people from being knocked back so that they can't, like, res somebody seems very important for that mode. But otherwise, the card specifically says that it's plus three damage resistance or plus three damage i call it damage reduction not damage resistance because a lot of damage resistance is uh, multiplicative but uh, damage reduction occurs after damage resistance so it's actually quite powerful if you can stack it however this is only going to occur while you're reviving somebody so it allows you to do a safe revive in lower difficulties around uh commons or in Acid, actually, even in the higher difficulty difficulties, you can probably get away with reviving an Acid. 
you can, let's see, um, urchin mines, all that stuff, uh, breaker swarms, you can reduce a lot of damage. And one of the main things to note is that if you reduce damage to zero, at least in the last patch, you don't take any trauma either. And a bunch of other weird effects according to what the uh, source of damage is. And so that's pretty good, except for the fact that it's while you're reviving. If this was powerful, more people would use pep talk. It's essentially pep talk, right? Even if we're considering acid, right? So you're standing in acid. This is reducing it down to zero. You're not taking any damage. You're now going to finish reviving somebody because acid lasts a lot longer than the four second revive timer. Or it's six. It's probably six. My bad. So you're reviving somebody. And then after you're done, both of you are now in acid. And you no longer have damage resistance. If this somehow lingers, that's very good. As far as the knockback immunity in campaign, on the higher difficulties, think about all the things that provide knockback. Tall boys, bruisers, exploders, volatiles, ogres, breakers. If you're going to revive me next to those things, I kindly ask you to fucking not. Because those things also do a ton of damage. And this is where you get into those pub moments where someone's more interested in picking you up just to get you into the fight. And then an ogre meatball comes in and downs you both. Thanks, pub. So there are situations where we are probably able to, like, abuse this. But it's going to be so fringe that it's not really... It shouldn't be your consideration going, oh, okay, we're going to pick Dan so that we can abuse the knockback immunity in campaign. It's probably not going to happen. Teammate incapacitations trigger enhanced combat prowess. Now this one, I'm hoping to get a handle on too because the devs really didn't uh, talk about it much during the dev stream. But during the dev stream, I noticed that whatever this buff is, A, it doesn't happen when you go down, which makes sense because it specifies teammate incapacitations. Apparently Dan is, has very low self-worth and he does not consider himself his own friend. Kind of sad. But the buff stacks has the same duration and refreshes duration exactly the same as Avenge the Fallen, which they had two copies of on team. Otherwise, they didn't have uh, knowledge is power, so we don't know exactly like how much damage this thing is giving. But again, this is going to be one of the first things that I'm going to be labbing come Friday. So, I mean... Maybe stop by and come on down. But um, definitely going to try and get a hold of this one as well. And okay. Four new enemies for Children of the Worm. They're not really explaining them very well here. So. The four enemies. We saw three during the dev stream. And what it appears is that uh, we have the crone, which is a bow-wielding cultist that seems to have very little health and eventually upgrades in to have fire arrows. We don't know like what that entails. We have the pus flinger, which uses the new bait jar accessory that is uh, down here, bait jars. And... We also don't know much about them, except that if they hit you with the bait jar, it will summon zombies. Zombies, sorry. Ridden. That will attack you specifically, and they have, like, a green, like, trail eye effect. So they're buffed by something. So maybe they deal more damage, something like that. It'll be interesting to see, actually. But otherwise, we have no idea exactly what those do. And we have uh, the Slasher, which is a melee, has like a bulletproof vest, it seems. And just um, seems relatively tanky. In the dev stream, <laughs> I'm going to be saying that a lot. In the dev stream, there was a point where Swing Point and Tiny Wendigo were on the boat in Act 1. Wendigo was a melee, and Swing Point was just Dan with a with a scar. 
and they encountered a slasher on the stairs. And Wendigo's using the new claw melee, and she's going to town on him, and he beats her with swing in the back, also backing her up. So they seem incredibly tanky. Maybe a lot of that is the, the armor. It doesn't seem to pop off like normal ridden armor that covers their weak spot. Like it seems like it's straight up like you're not dealing damage to this. So you have to aim more for like the head, the arms, and the legs. And what that's probably going to do is if you consider like bullet penetration and uh, low caliber or large caliber rounds, which is good for horde clear. If you're mowing through body shots in the horde, this guy is going to be able to still get up on you with full health. And that's potentially scary. And in fact, their silhouettes, maybe it's because, you know, it's kind of hard to pick them out on the stream. We're not used to them. But their silhouettes in general, right, is very low and human-like. So they're at the same, like, head level as normal Ridden. And they seemed to blend in pretty well with uh, hordes and allowed them to get the drop on uh, swinging in his team quite a bit. Of course, um, the Pusslinger has a bunch of like glowing green jars on his waist. So if he's out by himself, like you're not going to miss him. Um, the, the crone had like um, glowing eyes as well. Like... On, on their own, they probably don't do anything. But in, like, the middle of a horde, they probably, like, get away with a lot more than, uh, say, a tall boy who's, like, obviously, like, two head, two people tall. <laughs> so you see them, right? Or the wretches who are still, like, taller than normal commons. They're going to be more like the stalkers who, until they, like, decide to, like, leap up on the wall... Or, like, the urchin and the stalker have, like, the weak spot on their head, so it's much easier to pick them out. Again, maybe we're just new with it, but I think that these guys are going to be very tricky in how you maneuver with them. Anyways, that's a long explanation. But those three enemies we saw during the dev stream, and it seemed that what they do is they replace an entire family of um, mutation. So, on one of them... We had the the melee, the slasher. We had the crone, and then tall boys. And then we didn't see any stingers or wretches during that run. So it seems like you always get three mutations, and these can come up. We don't know what the odds are of it. Are they the same odds of, like, say, a crusher? Or are this, they the same odds, let's just say, a uh, tall boy family? Like... You either get Tallboy Family or you get this. And are they replacing specific ones? Because we had the double, like, bruiser melee with the slasher and the tall boy. So they're obviously not sharing the same pool, and it's an if-or. It'll be very interesting. And obviously, like, new enemies are exciting. Otherwise, the fourth enemy is a sniper. I don't think that we saw any of those. It might also be that uh, Swing Point just didn't see any on his point of view, but... I would think that the devs would try to show that off if they saw one in game. 14 new cards. Uh, these improvised cards are these gadget cards that we're talking about. There's one new bar burn card that is uh, Dust Eats Melee. Melee users rejoice. Two new director cards. I only added two of these. I mean, I guess there's a lot of other content in the game. And then 11 new player cards. Three new items, the bear trap. During the dev stream, they tried to... So, the bear trap will stun enemies that it grabs. It seems to have an AoE, I think they said. I honestly didn't notice it. But one thing to note is that um, they tried to bear trap a snitch. It didn't work. And then Toast said something like, it's too small. So, it's possible that even, like, stalker types and... I'm guessing, obviously, commons can just walk right over these. And so it seems, they're in the quick slot, by the way, it seems like it's more along the lines of we have barbed wire for light enemies, and then bear trap for heavy enemies. And if it gets mentioned down below, I'll bring these up again. Bait jars are basically 
I don't know, they're, they're firecrackers that you can hit enemies with. And so if your commons are doing a lot of damage because you're on a higher difficulty, then maybe this will work, but then also enemy health scales like significantly. So this just seems like another firecracker. Unless there's some other stat on here that we don't know about. So that one will probably have to be data mined. So that may take a little while. Smoke grenades. So they showed this one off during the dev stream too. And it was actually quite uh, quite impressive. They were going into an inner hive. Smoke grenade on the inner hive. And everybody just pretty much like sat there. And the commons didn't see them. So... It definitely works, and the smoke doesn't seem too intrusive to, like, players, so that's pretty good. It's just, um, it'll be interesting to see, like, where that's actually useful. Three new weapons, the Lockjaw, the Bow, and the Iron Claws. We did see these spawn in Act 1, so those of you who are concerned about if this, uh, if these items are going to show up in the... Old axe, yes, they will. And not only that, they gave us like some stuff for like the bow, the iron claws, and the lock jaw. The iron claws uh, inflict a bleed effect, and they gain um, an attack speed buff every time you kill something. Seems uh, decent uh, without stats, we don't know anything. The bow is in the secondary slot, it has infinite ammo. And you can fire it relatively quickly. Seems to have absolutely no like bullet penetration. It just hits one enemy and stops. And swing point said uh, 32 damage on the normal shot. And then if you fully charge it, it does like 132. We don't know if it has native weak spot damage. Because again, he did, didn't have knowledge as power. But uh, we'll be able to figure that out. Then of course the lockjaw. They didn't see this. It's a new sniper rifle that... When you shoot armor, some of the damage will apply to the ridden. We don't know the rate at which that happens, or if it goes straight into the weak spot, so then you pretty much bypass the armor. My guess is that if there's going to be a weapon that does this, it's going to be lower damage, like, I'd say, at least the M1A, but maybe between the M1A and the Phoenix, because the one-shot potential just isn't going to go on something that does as much damage as a bear at 50 cal, right? So it's probably going to be a lightweight, low damage scaling, but very usable, good for snap firing, and I would say like mediums and uh, lights, like um, you know the wretches, stuff like that, so that if they're armored, you still get away with it. Um, eight new expansion to exclusive cleaner skins. Uh, they've all been shown off on Twitter. They're pretty interesting. I like a lot of them. Two new non-expansion cleaner skins for Holly and Mom. Twelve new uh, expansion to exclusive weapon skins. There are a bunch of 8-bit skins. I honestly don't like the way that they looked on Twitter, but, you know, if we'd have to see them in-game. I don't use weapon skins anyway, so it's kind of moot for me. New banner sprays and emblems, always great. Um, Port Hope firing range update added. New expansion, two weapons to the firing range, and then minigun added. Minigun's really weird. I don't know why that would be necessary. Like, at all. I mean, I guess for funsies. But you can't really... I guess there... You could find a minigun in Swarm, but you're not supposed to, I believe. Um, Added new expansion, two weapons to the firing range. So obviously, the above-mentioned weapons, Iron Claws bow, lockjaw, that's great, I guess, but we still can't, like, attach cards to things, so these are kind of, like, it'd be nice to get a good feel of them, but that's about it. The fact that legendary weapons or uh, warped weapons aren't in there is still kind of feels bad, man, and also the fact that, again, you can't apply, like, even five cards because that's how much, like, that storm swarm starts with. I know that that's a sort of weird like metric to use, but the whole idea is that it's supposed to be a swarm practice area, but yet you're fighting cleaners that don't have cards or abilities. So at least five would be nice in there, 
and then also access to all the other attachments. Maybe not all the attachments, but you pretty much get legendary mags and then like green everything else. Ways, uh, new achievements and accomplishments. Okay. General bleed out time on nightmare increased by 50% and bleed out damage on no hope increased by 50%. So my take on this is that bleed out is your in cap timer. And we found out with the the mom in cap bug you have 400 in cap health take five every second but it's still health so enemies can uh, deal damage to you and reduce that timer so if bleed out damage on nightmare difficulties increased by 50 percent you're now losing seven and a half in cap health per second and on no hope it's going to be 10 so on no hope you're going to last 40 seconds on a safe revive or a safe in cap and on nightmare you're going to last about um it would be just short of a minute or a minute, something like that. It's not exactly like directly between the No Hope 40 and the Veteran 80 seconds because of the way that maths actually works, especially in this setting. And then, of course, just realize that anytime that you take damage, that's also going to apply. So even in you look at, uh, OK, so in No Hope, I get 40 seconds to revive somebody. That's perfectly fine. Well, enemies also deal more damage. So you take one hit from, like, say, a tall boy, and you've lost one quarter of that. So that's 10 seconds shaved off. So, that in mind. And this is very interesting that they would choose to do something like this. I'm guessing they either, A, decided that people turreting was kind of a big deal. Especially if they're going to release Dan, who benefits off people getting in-capped. Inspiring Sacrifice also applies to the person who's on the ground. Tons of damage. They're probably trying to... <laughs> Sounds silly, but they're probably trying to nerf him already. Um, friendly Fire on incapacitated players will no longer count towards player kicking. That's very weird. This might be so if you shoot somebody's corpse you can get friendly fire kicked and that might be what this technically is otherwise if you shoot someone who's on the floor i would think that maybe i don't know or maybe what it is is if you accidentally shoot somebody and in cap them they're technically in capped but there's they start in a standing position so it's easy to shoot them again and so then you could easily get the 100 kickable friendly fire damage so maybe that's also preventing that. I don't know. Knockback friendly fire kills now count towards player kicking criteria. What? Is there a way to knock people back? Like I suppose propane tanks? Like people were finding out how to knock people into out of bounds areas with propane tape. Like I don't understand this, but sure. Uh, battle lust trauma heal increased to twelve and a half percent from ten percent. This may look a little bit weird, but there'll be an explanation down below that I think might have something to do with this. And essentially, the card says. 0.125 trauma heal. So it's been buffed by 25%. Bravado heal increased to 15% of uh, trauma damage that allies take from 10%, and it's now scaled by healing efficiency. I actually popped this one out. Um, it's, everybody like was showing off the changes on the dev stream, and I noticed that uh, Bravado went from gain trauma health to heal trauma health and i've had uh discussions on uh the back for stats discord with uh squirrel lead uh gameplay director and um he was telling us that the distinction between heal and things like recover is that heal should be scaled by healing efficiency which makes sense and 
gain recover does not. So when the wording also changed from gain to heal, pretty much knew that this was going to scale with healing efficiency already, which puts it in a niche and it's actually pickable now. Uh, I'll try not to take like 20 minutes explaining. I still don't know if this is going to be good. Some people are like, okay, well, the healer, who's already going to be healing other people's uh, trauma, is going to be able to slowly heal, heal trauma over time. Well, that was technically what Bravada was doing anyways, except now if you have 100% healing efficiency, which is like two cards, then this goes up to, well, that would be 75%. So if you have two cards plus this, which is three cards, you will heal, let's just say, 30% of the trauma that other people take. So if somebody takes a tall boy slam and takes, well, let's just even say that it's, um, let's just say that somebody takes 20 trauma, right? We're not even going to say exactly what it is. Somebody takes 20 trauma, chances are is that you're going to use a med kit on them, right? But... For them taking 20 trauma, you're going to heal 6 trauma. So that's like 2 uh, field surgeons on you. Oh, okay, that's pretty good. But you have to have this trauma in the first place in order for you to heal it. And that's something that a lot of people are sort of like neglecting. Because some people are like, oh, okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to take uh, all the team healing cards so that we get 60% off medics. And then we're going to take EMT bag. Everybody has 110% healing efficiency. Everybody has bravado. And so what that means is if one person takes 20 trauma, everybody else gains 6. It'd be a little bit more than that. But you basically mitigated that trauma. No, you didn't. You just, like, swapped it around. What's actually going to end up happening is... If you don't have everybody at, like, say, 30 trauma at all times, you're not going to benefit from this. So then person A takes 20 trauma. They're now down another 20 trauma. Everybody else goes up 6. Person B takes 20 trauma. Everybody else goes up 6, except the one person who took 20 trauma in the first place. And now everybody else is almost capped out. <laughs> it's like uh, on your mark, but for trauma. And everybody's looking at it on paper, but not it practically. If you really wanted to eliminate trauma for three cards, either A, or, you know, three cards on the whole team for 12 cards total, either A, um, just take um, Fresh Bandage, Safe Room Recovery, and then just stick with that, or... If the idea is, okay, well, we need to heal trauma in the middle of the match because we need to keep our healing running and not, you know, take that uh, that attrition. Uh, guess what? There's three trauma cards, right? Trauma resist cards. You take Doc, you take Fanny Pack, you take Durable, and you take Body Armor. Guess what? That's 70% trauma reduction. That's pretty much going to do the same exact thing that this does, except nobody has to take damage. And it's going to give you everybody a med slot. It's going to give everybody a little bit of health. And if you really want to go crazy, um, switch any one of those into wooden armor. It's actually not nearly as bad as people are saying it is. And then, of course, that can bring you up to, what would that be, 85% trauma, <laughs> trauma and resistance? Like, it basically doesn't exist at that point. And then, of course, you have Doc. Just put on Field Surgeon on there, and it'll take care of everything. So, it, no hassle whatsoever. I, I don't know. I think that this could have use. Again, obviously, it's scaling with healing efficiency. You'd want to use it on a medic. So, if you're using a healing efficiency build, and you don't want to have to use, you know, uh, med kits on yourself, because you're using med kits on other people... This is sort of like Charitable Soul, but for, you know, Trauma Heal, because Charitable Soul doesn't transfer Trauma Heal. Well, I guess we're going to have to see, right? So, this is the problem, though. If you're scaling healing efficiency, 
you don't want to waste healing efficiency, so you probably also have overheal, which gives you more healing efficiency. Look at that. Now, if you have overheal, people have THP, they're going to take less trauma. And if people take less trauma, <laughs> you don't necessarily have to use med kits on them as much, and you're not going to get as much out of bravado because they're not going to take trauma. Because bravado, unlike sadist, counts final, like trauma taken. So even if you have THP and it gets blocked, you took zero trauma, you get zero benefit. Like, I can see you buying this. This is at least buyable, and it might be pickable. I'm still going to have to do some tests with it, but I don't know if this is actually going to be noticeable at all. Unless, of course, like, you're again, you're stacking healing efficiency on the team, throwing this on everybody, but again, just get three trauma resist cards then. You'd actually, like, I don't know, you still get the healing efficiency, I guess, that when you revive people, there'll be full health, or your bandages heal for double, but it there's, there's better ways to deal with uh, healing efficiency, I believe, than bravado. Breakout got a buff. It's now 25% faster again. Okay. Um, the problem with breakout is not the duration that it takes now, because the duration that it takes is insane. The problem with breakout is that everything that pins you deals damage on grab and on release. So let's take the Nightmare Ferocious Crusher, right? The the big one. Uh, has 100% um, uh, damage as trauma. Just kidding, it's actually plus one to its trauma coefficient which is already one on the grab. So when it grabs you, it does baseline three damage, plus 35% from a nightmare, and then it's ferocious, so it's going to increase that by, what is it, 50%? So it's going to go up to six damage. So it's going to grab you for six damage, and then deal double that as trauma. So you're going to just immediately take 12 trauma for him grabbing you. Uh, this is going to take um, one and a half seconds for you to break free. So depending on where the server tick is occurring, you're going to take one, maybe two hits here. Or another, like, six each. So you're now at, like, 24 trauma. And then when you snap out of it, you're going to take release damage, which thankfully you've only been in here for, like, two ticks, so it's not going to be that much, but it's still going to be somewhere around four. So you're going to take 30 trauma just for having been grabbed once and this is the problem with evangelo is he has a talent which stuns something for six seconds it's actually quite impressive but you got to take 30 trauma for it not worth it in my opinion now obviously if you think that breakout is good then this is obviously a buff you're going to take maybe one less tick of damage but again due to the way that the server tick uh, occurs it occurs at a certain time on the server, no matter how long you've been grabbed, or when you started getting grabbed. So you might get hit once by this, you might get hit twice. Whereas before, you might get hit twice. So you might save some damage. I don't know. Defensive Maneuver, the category and icon for this card have been updated to better reflect its newer functionality of damage resistance instead of move speed, so it's probably a green card. Hired gun, uh, reduced skull totem cost, and then copper gain up to two. Um, I don't use burn cards, but some people have said that this might actually be worth it now. But it's still going to cuck you from your other skull totem, like, targets, which are where all the broken shit is. But being able to get double the cost... Up to 750 kills means that this is um, up to 1,500 copper, which is how much you would, uh, a little bit more than you would get from Share the Wealth. So it's actually like considerably good, so long as your team is actually in a map that long to get 750 kills. Uh, Lucky Penny's bonus increased from 35% uh, to 100%. Well, guess what? Um, Lucky Pennies isn't a meme anymore. A lot of people have been getting overexcited about this, I think. 
Um, Lucky Pennies is, we have decided among the Back for Stats community that it is now a fourth string card. Fourth string does not mean fourth tier. What fourth string means is that if you're going to take a fourth copper card, like you've decided this is going to occur, right? First thing you're going to grab is Money Grubbers, hands down. Second thing you're going to grab, Copper Scavenger. Because, well, it makes Money Grubbers better, and it also provides a lot of worth. The third card you're going to grab is either Bounty Hunter or Share the Wealth. Probably Share the Wealth. And then if you haven't grabbed Bounty Hunter, your fourth card is either going to be Bounty Hunter, Share the Wealth, or Hazard Pay. So that's what I mean by fourth string card. The only time that Lucky Pennies gives great payout is when Cost of Avarice is on the map. And, well, Cost of Avarice is already going to win you the match, so the run, so it doesn't really matter if you had Lucky Pennies or not. If you find this in a lockbox, you could easily get 500 from this, actually. All you have to do is get it to proc on somewhere between... Four to six, I believe somebody said. Four to six piles, depending on the size of the piles. And you're going to benefit from this. Now, a lot of people have been uh, saying that this stacks with um, Money Grubbers in the way that Money Grubbers is going to alter the value of the pile and then that gets doubled by Lucky Pennies. That's not true. This is going to affect the pile and then Money Grubbers gets added. On your mark, ammo gain increased from 7.5% from 5%. So, you may have remembered the last patch, and I believe that I even, like, sort of got perturbed about it. Um, on your mark, was previously listed to give 10% ammo. And last patch, they said, oh, guess what? We found out that on your mark was occurring twice, once at the start of the buff, once at the, the, uh, the end of the buff. We got rid of the end of the buff effect because it was bugged. What they didn't know was that it was giving you 5% of your ammo at the start, 5% of the ammo at the end. So when they removed the end effect, you now got 5% of your ammo and it got nerfed by 50%. Hence them saying from 5%. They know what they did. So now it's been buffed up to 7.5%. So it's between where it was now and where it was then. So if you still felt like On Your Mark was giving you good value, then it's even better. If you were kind of like missing the ant loss of ammo from before, it's still going to be exactly the... It's not going to be as good, but it's still better than it is now. It's going to be kind of close. And with the new gadget cards, this might see more value. Another thing to note... So that if you're using on your mark, obviously, if you're full on your SMG, sniper, and shotgun per se, because you're using assault rifles, when this goes off, you didn't get 7.5% of all your ammo. You got 7.5% of your assault rifle ammo. So keep that in mind when you're deciding how many of these to put on your team and how your team goes about these things. Because I see a lot of people say that this is like one of the best ammo generation cards in the game. And... <laughs> otherwise occurring on a horde is not the problem that the previous thing i mentioned right making sure that all your ammos aren't topped off that's the problem there's a skill gap to it otherwise i'll, I'll go over it later i think uh, pinata base item chance reduced from from 15 to 10 i'm glad that it got buffed however Item chance now increases by one per each AI killed, so basically it has a pity rate. Now, people might be wondering why they added this. It always had this, which is weird that it says now increases. Maybe it says it on the card now, but this is a clarification of what it was doing before. Our data miner found out that it had a, uh, a pity rate like a long time ago. Like, pretty much not when it came out but when the the last update came out that it starts at 15 percent if you don't kill something it goes up to one percent what we don't know is how it technically calculates that there's a huge disparity in like the effectiveness of the card if it can't count on the same frame in succession 
that's a whole bunch of words. Um, pretty much just know that this isn't going to be anything. When it was at 15%, the 1% pity rate didn't mean anything. Now that it's at 10, the 1% pity rate can mean something. Just, <laughs> so, if you thought, oh no, Pinata's dead because it got nerfed by 10%, or by 5%, no, it's still going to be ridiculous. You're just going to make slightly less items than before. Not even less than a third because of this pity rate that was already there. Scar Tissue updated the description to accurately uh, reflect its 50% acid damage resistance. See, now this is what I don't get. Scar Tissue, again, always had this, at least as long as I've been labbing the card, right? And yet they say that this now increases when it already did. It's weird. Anyways, one thing to note about Scar Tissue is yes, it has 50% acid damage resistance. Um, Kethustis tells me that uh, this actually just updated on Swarm last patch, which is very weird, but then again, Swarm cards are different than campaign cards in a number of ways. It's weird stuff, I guess. Technically, two different games. Um, when something is dealing damage, it is either this acid damage resistance or the negative one damage reduction of the card. So keep that in mind. Otherwise, Technically speaking, if both of them occurred, Scar Tissue would just shut off wretches and swarm, and they do absolutely no damage. 3 when wet, cooldown modifier increased to 50% from uh, 20%. Cool. Like, I don't know, there might be some sort of, like, memory that you can do with, like... No, you'd still have to get grabbed. Like, it, it's good, I guess. Like, 50% increased uh, cooldown modifier would mean that it'd take one-third less. So then it would be tw 20 seconds. Cool. Spiky bits. Damage decreased. So this is basically just reducing the damage to the point to where... Your bash cannot kill commons on higher difficulties. But it still technically can if you hit the head. But once you start getting into, like, say, No Hope and Higher End Nightmare, this is going to stop working. But in your lower difficulties, yeah, Spiky Bits is still going to work. And as far as everything else is concerned, the Machete got a nerf, but Machete is still good. It can lose literally 5 damage. And the fire axe and the mission and the hatchet didn't really even use this anyways unless it was for the DR. So they don't really care. This is literally to stop spiky fists. Corruption card updates, uh biohazard and toxic spill, had their fog strength and effects reduced. Okay. Um item updates. Objective th item throw speeds decreased to one hundred from throw objective items? What? Back grenades? Hmm. It means something. We're going to figure it out eventually. Uh, medical grade taser has been renamed to EMT jumper cables. I love it. Description now mentions that it has an AoE stun on use. Good. Weapon updates shotgun pellet damage ranges now correctly match their damage base damage ranges. This is good. Thank you. So, in the last update, they said that they nerfed the range of the TAC-14 and its damage, and then buffed the range of the 870 Express and its damage. What they actually did was it affected what's called the Power Pellet, or I call it the Power Pellet. There is the first hit the first uh, pellet that hits an enemy deals more damage. And that's what increased to 11 on the 870. So they dialed that back a bit. And then what they did was they buffed the pellet damage to pretty much the same thing. And up here, they're just looking at damage ranges match their damage ranges. Because, again, they pretty much like scuffed that whole deal. 
and now the damage ball off correctly starts at 875 meters at all tiers instead of just tier 1. So what this basically means is that um, 870 Express now correctly has longer range, and it deals more damage than it did before. Don't worry about that. Spawning updates. Hordes now have an increased chance to spawn Special Ridden as the act progresses. Starts at 50% and increases to 75%. Previously was only 50. So um, near the end of the act, you're going to see 50% more specials whenever you activate a Horde. Which, okay, that, that might actually be a significant change. We're going to have to see how that works. But that's specifically during Hordes, so mention that. It's not going to be roamers or wanderers. Spot updates, spot ammo drop behavior has been modified. Light, medium, shotgun, rifle ammo now will drop ammo. Less ammo. Okay, let's see what's happening here. So they're dropping 33% less ammo. However, they're dropping it. When you're at half ammo. Which seems better to me. Of course, drop radius. They don't want to all three bots dropping ammo at the same time. And the cooldown has been doubled. I don't think this is going to make a difference. Unless they fix the bug where if you just drop all your ammo, then the bots see you as having zero ammo. And then you pick up ammo and you're now less. And then they'll go ahead and they'll drop it for you. Plus, you get three bots, so. <laughs> it's, I don't think that this is going to make a difference. It might, though. I don't play with bots a lot. I'm, I would have to ask somebody who actually uses a lot of bots. I, I still think that this is highly abusable. Um, Ridden update. Updated hit reaction animations for mutated ridden animations. Reaction behavior is AI. Made improvements to the sleepers AI while pouncing on cleaners. More AI. Wretch slow effect reduced to 55% from 75. Okay. Say so. Does that affect swarm? Uh, nursery level randomization updated to vary the enemies and exit positions after a party wipes and continues. Didn't even realize. That's good. Uh, swarm. I'm going to skip all of swarm because I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Um, although right here, it seems like they more than doubled the amount of supply points that you're getting, but they didn't do anything to possibly get Skull Totems. And they added a whole bunch of cards. I know Keithustus has a video, be sure to link to that, and you guys can, you know, hear from somebody who actually knows what the hell they're talking about when it comes to the Swarm stuff. Um, console updates, I have no idea what the hell this is. Um, bug fixes an issue where some weapons were off-centered on certain skin previews on the Armory or talking to Dusty and Fort Hope. Um, okay. You use skins, I guess that's good. Uh, fix an issue where selected default decks would all appear as custom deck and swarm. Hold up. Do I actually display my deck name now? Oh no. That could get scary. <laughs> fix an issue where players could duplicate decks while just rejoining a session and loading into the next mission. Great. Um, I don't really play as much pubs as I used to anymore, but still, that's good that they eliminated that. Armored Exploders fixed a card where this was missing a text description. Oh, okay. Um, nothing there, though. Chronic Injuries uh, fixed an issue where this warp chest would uh, increase players' damage resistance instead of reducing it. Not find that out. Did we find that out? Interesting. Quite hilarious. Cost of Avarice fixed an issue where the de damage debuff disappeared when a cleaner was rescued from a pod. Makes sense because it te technically re refreshes a lot of buffs. I wonder if they got the rest of those too. Uh, medical Professional fixed issue where Medical Professional did not work for the self-revive of the EMT jumper cables. Okay. Sluggish fixed an issue where this card reduced player's move speed by 3.03% instead of 5%. Okay. Uh, well rested. Fixed issue where the tire. What? 
or a player's entire temporary health bar flash while healing with this card equipped. Is that the sound effect that was happening? I'll have to see if they fixed that sound effect bug. I'm guessing it's a bug. Technically, it's working as intended, but it's annoying when you overheal with, like, say, Poultice or Inspiring Sacrifice, and then it just keeps going off. It's a rave. Um, Dr. Roger's Neighborhood Garden Party fixed issue where monster cards, monstrous cards were removed after a player destroyed the main nest. Um, campaign. Fixed issue where re recruit veteran difficulty copper occasionally fluctuated. What? Okay. I, I don't quite understand that. Uh, environmental fog may be too thick in every map. Okay. Fixed an issue where a defibrillator could get consumed and not grant appropriate supply points after being revived during the mission complete screen. That's very specific, but okay. Fixed an issue where healing efficiency would not apply to tra trauma damage healing. Now this is where my salt of the patch is coming in. <laughs> but Bits, aren't you a, a medic main? Yes, but I like actual builds in medic and not to have them all be homogenized so and the other thing is is that having tons of discussions with um squirrel and previously when we found the healing efficiency bug like long long ago um i was told specifically healing efficiency was not supposed to scale trauma healing like at all now of course up at um what is it bravado they specifically changed it that I'm fine with because Bravado needed something. But otherwise, like, it's the healer's job to, like, heal trauma. But the main thing that happened last patch is by pumping everything into melee and doing team healing efficiency, the melee now becomes the medic, and you don't really have... You've consolidated two roles into one person. Okay, like get with the times bits i can do that but there was always a distinction in classic medical between generating a thp engine between being a like say a scav doc or just straight up buying through um trauma with uh med kits and stuff like that and so there was different ways to mitigate trauma. And so now with the long, long ago, um, Vanguard being switched to health, Amped Up being switched to health, it has pretty much became more and more that medics now heal trauma. Like, that's what they do. And by making healing efficiency heal trauma damage, this applies to all sources of trauma damage healing then it just becomes a no-brainer. You throw EMT bag on literally everything that would potentially want to be a medic. If this applies to medical professional, that's going to be huge. If it applies to field surgeon, that's going to be huge. But field surgeon has kind of already been the like staple for trauma recovery in a scab doc deck. Find lots of items, then use the number of items in order to slowly mitigate trauma. And she also has healing efficiency. So while I don't think that her 15% healing efficiency really moves the needle a lot, it does move the needle and it further cements her as people's opinion of this is the one character that heals trauma. Whereas all they had to do was like buff field surgeon to be competitive. The one thing that I do see out of this, which is kind of nice, is the fact that um, healing trauma pretty much just got completely trounced on by the toolkit change. And apparently they're not going to revert the toolkit change because everybody loves it. So now medical cards need to somehow surpass a white toolkit with uh, their investment in order to heal trauma. And that's apparently going to be, guess what? You stack healing efficiency on any build that you would consider a medic. Even if you're not technically a medic, hey, why not just grab a medex and then everybody has healing efficiency. This should not apply to the, the first aid cabinets. 
because healing efficiency doesn't apply to the shop heal. So I would guess that that's not going to happen. If that was the case, this would be absolutely ridiculous, and I don't understand. I would suggest that it doesn't occur to fresh bandages and safe room recovery. I'm honestly hoping that this is just people got their wires crossed about these updates. Oh, sorry, not here. Bravado. But then, of course, trauma heal increase got changed from 10% to 12.5%. So either they got the decimals mixed up or this does actually scale as well. And they just coded it to be like, okay, so if Battle Lust heals, say, 3, because you have, like, that much healing efficiency, then multiply it by 12.5%, and that's how much trauma you heal. Again, I'm kind of hoping that that's not the case. The other thing to note here that would make a little bit of sense is, as I said in my February medical, like, interactions video, um, previously field surgeon and... MedX would heal 3 and 1 respectively, and then they would also give you a health heal for 3 and 1 respectively. And that was scaled by healing efficiency. So I guess it could be an issue fixed because those cards were supposed to, because otherwise it doesn't make sense why the healing portion would. It's odd. I recently suggested that they just change it to those cards to recover. That way it just... You don't have that weird interaction, but also just making them healing efficiency would probably, I would, <laughs> it would at least solve that so that I don't have to keep explaining how that works. Um, I'm just going to look through the rest of these for anything else that's notable. We're getting to uh, one hour already. Bots. Fixed an issue where bots could reuse legendary items infinitely if a player who previously had the items left an ongoing campaign. Or what technically would happen is all you would have to do is finagle them into their inventory and clear the level, and then they would have them. This is important because of the fact of if you get a, obviously, the nurse purse, which heals all trauma, I believe, health and lives you get that on a bot they get unlimited uses you no longer have to worry about trauma if you um have a legendary defib on them then they will have uh, access to unlimited lives technically because it'll keep reviving them generally bots have a cooldown but that doesn't matter with uh jumper cables so you can repeatedly down them and eventually the fallen will refresh its duration Every time that it uh, you get more stacks, and it stacks indefinitely, unlike Inspiring Sacrifice. So you can have somebody just repeatedly down bot Evangelo. Meanwhile, everybody else is just going forward with unlimited damage and reload speed and ammo, and just completely obliterating the map. So I'm glad that they made this change. I still think that they need to do a little bit more with bots, but that's whatever it is. Yeah, that's uh, about everything that we have here. So I'm going to pretty much edit through me looking through all of this. I hope that you guys enjoyed the analysis of these patch notes. If you have any other questions that you want answered, again, you can stop by the stream, ask them then. This Friday, what, what, what day would that be? That would, <laughs> that would be Friday, September 2nd at 3 p.m. Pacific time or either of the two consecutive days after that, or you can throw them down in the comments below, and I'll get to them when I can get to them. And until next time, I'll catch you guys around.